part one, and I'm going to now turn it over to Dan Brannon of the firm Brannon and Brannon in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Uh, Dan supervised much of the work that he'll be talking about in terms of the early evolution of rights of nature laws in the United States. And he'll start us out with part two of this class, uh, first looking at the anatomy of rights of nature laws, and then looking at case studies of enforcement of these laws in Pennsylvania, or Oregon, and Ohio. And with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Dan. Thank you, Thomas. My name is Dan Brandon. I am a lawyer in private practice in Santa Fe, New Mexico. For two decades now, my practice has included working in the areas of a right of local self-government and more recently, rights of nature. My presentation is going to cover two main topics. The first topic is an anatomy of U.S. rights of nature laws. And we will look in particular at the three main components that U.S. rights of nature laws have had to date. And then the second portion of my presentation will involve uh, looking at enforcement of rights of nature laws in the United States. And there we will look in particular at the two primary modes of enforcement. One is direct enforcement and the other is intervention. Starting with an anatomy of U.S. rights of nature laws, we're going to look at a case study in the city of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Pittsburgh was faced back in 2010 with a proposal for hydraulic fracturing for natural gas within the city limits. Hydraulic fracturing, also known as hydrofracking or just fracking, is a process by which uh, oil and gas developers uh, pump water, sand, and chemicals into wells in order to free up uh, oil and gas for extraction. Uh, the process uh, produces wastewater, and the entire process uh, can pollute water supplies in the vicinity where it is being done. The city of Pittsburgh was concerned with this, and so they adopted uh, a Rights of Nature Law in 2010 that appears at Chapter 618.03 of the Pittsburgh Municipal Code. That Rights of Nature Law recognizes the rights of ecosystems within the city of Pittsburgh. We're going to look at, in detail at the provisions of that Municipal Code, and we'll see that there are three main elements of a Rights of Nature Law. The first element is recognition of rights. Normally this involves recognition of rights of nature and it can be uh, ecosystems, species, um, water, air, other elements of nature, and also recognition of the rights of people uh, to healthy nature and ecosystems. The second provision in a rights of nature law is a standing provision the standing provision defines uh, who has the ability to come into court to uh, vindicate rights under the law. And the third provision is a remedies provision, which defines what are the remedies for uh, violations or threatened violations of the law. So let's look at the first of those elements, recognition of rights. In Pittsburgh's Municipal Code at Chapter 618.03a, there is a right to water. It says all residents, natural communities, and ecosystems in Pittsburgh possess a fundamental and inalienable right to sustainably access, use, consume, and preserve water drawn from natural water cycles that provide water necessary to sustain life within the city. And then Chapter 618.03b contains the rights of natural communities. It says natural communities and ecosystems, including but not limited to wetlands, streams, rivers, aquifers, and other water systems, possess inalienable and fundamental rights to exist and flourish within the city of Pittsburgh. There are a couple of things to note about these provisions. As I mentioned up front, Pittsburgh's law recognizes rights both for nature itself, in this case, natural communities and ecosystems and certain elements thereof, 
but also recognizes the right of residents to having healthy, clean, sustainable, natural communities and ecosystems. In addition, you'll note that these provisions define these rights as fundamental and inalienable. Uh, there's a very specific reason for doing this under uh, constitutional jurisprudence. Fundamental rights are subject to strict, strict scrutiny, which is the most stringent form of protection afforded constitutional rights. And these rights of nature laws, by calling the rights of natural communities and of residents, calling them fundamental, is meant to give those rights that strict scrutiny protection whenever there's a threat of violation of them by the government. The second element of rights of nature laws is standing. The Pittsburgh Municipal Code at chapter 618.03b says, residents of the city shall possess legal standing to enforce those rights on behalf of those natural communities and ecosystems the word those there is referring to the earlier sentence in that section that we looked at on the previous screen, which defined what the rights of the natural communities and ecosystems are. And then chapter 618.05D says, any person who brings an action to secure or protect the rights of natural communities or ecosystems within the city of Pittsburgh shall bring that action in the name of the natural community or ecosystem in a court of competent jurisdiction. There are a number of things that we need to look at in terms of the way these provisions work. The first is obvious. It gives standing to residents to enforce the rights of nature because someone needs to come into court for nature and do that. But second and very importantly, uh, it says that such actions shall be brought in the name of uh, the natural community or ecosystem itself. Civil procedure laws, which some of us are probably familiar with, say that a, an action usually must be brought in the name of the real party in interest. This provision of the standing section of the municipal code is designed to make clear that when there's a lawsuit filed, nature itself is the real party in interest with authority to come into court to protect or vindicate its rights under the law. And so the residents are really there to uh, represent those rights for nature. This, this provision has not only that legal import, but it has a cultural import. Uh, many in the rights of nature movement, as Thomas uh, covered in his presentation, are trying to get our society to assist to a place at which it recognizes that nature is not an object or a commodity to be owned and exploited but nature is itself an entity that, is, uh, that has rights and that whose rights are to be protected. And part of accomplishing that culture shift over time in society is working in these laws to recognize that nature itself is showing up with its own standing in the enforcement actions. The third element of a rights of nature law, as we've said, is the remedies provision. In Pittsburgh's municipal code, it's at chapter 618.05D. It says, damages shall be measured by the cost of restoring the natural community or ecosystem to its pre-damaged state and shall be paid to the city of Pittsburgh or other applicable governmental entity to be used exclusively for the full and complete restoration of the natural community or ecosystem. The import of this provision is to make it clear that rights of nature laws are meant to be an advancement beyond what conventional environmental laws tend to provide. Many environmental laws tend to uh, do small things like require buffer zones, planting of a few trees, doing minor things that are meant to uh, pretty up uh, a destroyed site, uh, but not completely restore that, restores, that destroyed site. Rights of nature laws, as they're being passed in the US now, move beyond that and make it clear that the remedy for violation of the rights of nature law is complete restoration of the natural community or ecosystem 
to its pre-damaged state. To summarize, we've looked at the three elements of rights of nature laws as they've been enacted in municipalities in the United States. The first element is a declaration of the legal rights. The second element is a recognition of standing for nature, for residents, or in the case of uh, Native American tribes for tribal members to bring lawsuits to vindicate the rights of nature. And the third element is the explanation of what is the remedy, ideally involving a requirement of complete restoration. Having covered an anatomy of US rights of nature laws, we are now going to turn, turn toward looking at enforcement those rights of nature laws in the U.S. And in particular, we're going to look at the two main methods of enforcement. One is direct enforcement, and the other is intervention by ecosystems in cases brought by other parties. The first case we're going to look at is in Florida, a case that Thomas mentioned in his presentation. It's called Wild Cypress Branch versus Beach Line South Residential LLC. It was filed just this year in April 2021 in Florida State Court. Some backstory to this case, uh, people in uh, Florida were experiencing uh, severe environmental deg degradation. They were experiencing algae blooms, some of which they are called uh, red tides, similar to what the people in uh, Toledo had experienced in Lake Erie. Uh, they were experiencing dead life in the waters and uh, Biscayne Bay in particular had reached uh, a point at which it had zero dissolved oxygen levels. Many in Florida were very alarmed by this state of affairs, considered it a perfect storm of problems. And so the people in Orange County, Florida decided to uh, propose a charter amendment uh, for adoption by initiative at the ballot in November of 2020. Uh, as Thomas covered, that charter amendment passed overwhelmingly with about 89% of uh, the voters supporting it. In Orange County, the Wild Cypress Branch case involves a developer who proposes to fill over 100 acres of wetlands and other waters in Orange County for the construction of a 1900 acre housing and commercial development. In order to uh, do this development, the developer requires and so applies for a dredge and fill permit under section 404 of the Federal Clean Water Act. In Florida, that federal act is uh, by delegation enforced by the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. The Wild Cypress Branch case uh, is, is the first direct enforcement action filed by nature uh, in the United States. It was filed in the name of Wild Cypress Branch and other bodies of water in Orange County. And the purpose of the lawsuit is to stop the filling of the wetlands by the developer and to stop the permitting of the entire project uh, by the Florida DEP under the Clean Water Act. Wild Cypress Branch and the other elements of nature in that case stated two main claims in their complaint filed in April. The first set of claims uh, says that the county rights of nature law prohibits the filling of wetlands by the developer. Uh, if you look at the complaint, it begins by saying that the Orange County Charter Amendment recognizes the rights of the waters of Orange County to exist, flow, be free of pollution, and maintain a healthy ecosystem. It goes on to argue or assert that the filling wetlands would violate those uh, elements of nature's rights to exist, and that the impacts on other creeks and lakes in Orange County would violate their right to be free of pollution, to flow, and to maintain a healthy ecosystem. This first claim asks the court to enjoin the actions of the developer that would violate those legal rights. In other words, as a direct enforcement action filed prior to the beginning of the harmful activity, the lawsuit actually seeks to prevent the activity by injunction before it happens. 
the second set of claims in the Wild Cypress Ranch case is uh, concerns the permitting process under Section 404 of the Clean Water Act. The second set of claims alleges that the state regulatory agency is bound by the rights of nature law in the Orange County Charter Amendment. It says the Florida Department of Environmental Protection cannot issue a permit that violates the legal rights established by the Orange County Charter Amendment. It also alleges that issuing a wetlands fill permit would violate the rights of various waterways guaranteed under the Charter Amendment. And so the claim, similar to the first claim, asks for the court to enjoin the issuance of the permit for the project. That case, since it was just filed in April, is obviously in its beginning stages. So uh, I don't even think that an answer has been filed. Uh, and obviously there are no results to talk about yet, but it will be an interesting case to follow uh, being the first direct enforcement action uh, by nature under these U.S. municipal rights of nature laws. The second case study we're going to look at is from Pennsylvania. It is the case Pennsylvania General Energy versus Grant Township, which was filed in, the, in federal court in the Western District of Pennsylvania in 2014. Grant Township is a township in Indiana County, Pennsylvania, that in 2000 adopted a local law uh, to ban fracking and wastewater injection wells from operating within the township. Uh, similar to the city of Pittsburgh, uh, the people of Grant Township were concerned uh, that the injection of wastewater into wells, frack wastewater into wells within the township uh, could harm their water supplies. Part of Grant Township's ordinance recognized the rights of ecosystems within the township a company named Pennsylvania General Energy, which operated a proposed injection well at the time, uh, sued the township to overturn the law in federal court. The Little Mahoning watershed, consisting of the Little Mahoning Creek and the watershed that feeds the creek, filed a motion in the case to intervene in the, lit in the litigation to protect its interests. Uh, that motion was filed on behalf of the watershed by a group called the East Run Hellbenders Society. Some of you may know hellbenders are a type of salamander that, that I believe is native to the waters in that area. The East Run Hellbender Society filed its motion, uh, even though Grant Township was expected to and did put up a, a, a full defense of the ordinance, the watershed filed its own motion to intervene, and it said that uh, as an ecosystem within the township, uh, along with it associated aquatic and terrestrial natural communities, the Little Mahoney Creek and its tributaries and underlying groundwater systems, uh, that th those elements of nature had rights uh, under the Grant Township Ordinance that they wanted to show up to protect. They said in their intervention motion, if the underlying ordinance is invalidated, and the watershed will lose the rights recognized by Grant's ordinance and will suffer the harms currently prevented by the recognition of those rights. It's important to note that even though Grant Township was defending its ordinance fully, uh, the uh, watershed's position was a township has an obligation as a township to all of its citizens and to all of the area within the township, and that even though Grant Township intended to defend the ordinance fully, the watershed had its own rights under the ordinance that were different from the township-wide uh, obligations that the township had to look out for. And that was the basis on which the watershed said that uh, it should be allowed to intervene to protect its own rights, even though Grant Township was defending the ordinance. Pennsylvania General Energy filed a brief in opposition to the motion for intervention. It read, quote, incredibly, the motion to intervene seeks, apparently for the first time in American jurisprudence, for a condition of nature, in this case the watershed, to intervene in a lawsuit. We went on to write, the watershed does not meet the definition of a person under the federal rules of civil procedure, 
and lacks the most fundamental capacities necessary to be a participant in the judicial process. The watershed is neither an appropriate candidate for party status in a court of law, nor feasibly represented, which was an interesting thing for PGE to, uh, to allege in its opposition, given how the court eventually ruled. If you're in a jurisdiction that requires a verification code, please write the following code word down. Light. L-I-G-H-T. Light. The court in the Western District of Pennsylvania Federal Court denied the watershed's motion to intervene. It began by saying, quote, it is vital to discuss at the outset that a presumption arises that there is an adequacy of representation when the party in the action representing the interests of the intervener, applicant, is the government, unquote. The court went on to decide, quote, the mission of the nonprofit organization aligns exactly to the terms of the ordinance being defended by Grant Township, as well as it should, since the organization advocated for the adoption of the ordinance. So in other words, the court ruled that Grant Township adequately represented the interests of the watershed and therefore the watershed did not need to intervene to represent its own interests. Even though the court decided the motion on that issue, the court then went on to opine about whether a watershed could have standing uh, if, its ad- if its interests were not adequately represented by the government. And on that issue, the court said, quote, as to the issue of whether the Little Mahoning watershed and ecosystem has standing under the law, no determination need be made here. Clear and convincing evidence has not been produced to show that defendants' vigorous defense of the ordinance, the terms of which protect the watershed in all of its locations, do not line up precisely. So the district court uh, dodged, did not opine on the issue of um, standing if interests were not adequately represented. The watershed took the case up to the Third Circuit Court of Appeals the Court of Appeals affirmed the denial of the intervention motion in a non-presidential decision in July 2016. It affirmed on the same reason that the district court denied the motion in the first place, agreeing that the uh, watershed's interests were adequately represented by Grant Township. Uh, the court, though, went on to drop a footnote to opine on the issue of standing And it said, quote, we do not see, however, how a watershed could be considered a proper party under Civil Procedure Rule 17. Under that rule, in order to be a party to a lawsuit, the purported litigant must have the capacity to sue or be sued. The plain language of Rule 17 does not permit an ecosystem such as the Little Mahoning watershed to sue anyone or be sued by anyone. And for that reason alone, we have misgivings with the watershed being listed as a party in this litigation. But because this particular issue was not pursued on appeal, and given the non-presidential nature of this opinion, we make no specific holding on the question. So the Third, third, third Circuit made clear how it felt about the issue. It's important to look at the portion of that dicta where it said uh, Rule 17 does not permit any consistent to intervene. Intervention law uh, in, under Rule 17 uh, generally says that you can look to whether uh, state law uh, grants a party uh, standing to intervene or show up in a, in, 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 a, in a litigation. And Grant Township's ordinance, of course, uh, said that the watershed could do so. Um, a, a, Township ordinance is a part of state law within the entire system of law. And so there are arguments to be made by lawyers that, in fact, uh, a rights of nature law that confers standing on nature does satisfy the Rule 17 uh, requirement. The the Third Circuit disagreed with that, though. The next case we're looking at is from Ohio. It was Jews Farms Partnership versus City of Toledo. It was filed in the Northern District of Ohio in 2019. As Thomas covered in his presentation, uh, the people of Toledo had been experiencing 
since 2014, severe algae blooms uh, in Lake Erie. Algae blooms are a product of uh, agribusiness fertilizer runoff that ends up feeding bacteria in the lake. Those bacteria grow to unnatural uh, levels, amounts, and quantities, and end up blocking oxygen to things below them in the lake and also contain toxins that, uh, if it gets into this city's water system, are harmful to people. And so faced with this uh, threat, uh, Toledoans for Safe Water formed and worked to uh, propose a Lake Erie Bill of Rights, uh, again by initiative at the polls in February 2019. Uh, the voters uh, voted a little over 60% in favor of adopting that Lake Erie Bill of Rights to give rights of nature to Lake Erie. The, I think the very day after the vote in February 2019, Dews Farms Partnership and Agribusiness Interest sued the city of Toledo, yes, the day after voters adopted the Lake Erie Bill of Rights. So they were obviously prepared ahead of time to file the lawsuit. And in that lawsuit, Dews Farms sought federal, the federal court order invalidating the Lake Erie Bill of Rights because of infringement on uh, the farm's constitutional rights, and because of uh, state and federal preemption. Toledoans for Safe Water filed a motion to intervene on behalf of Lake Erie as the real party in interest there. The intervention motion said, quote, the interest of the Lake Erie ecosystem reposes in its right to exist, flourish, and naturally evolve, as denominated in the Lake Erie Bill of Rights. The intervention motion went on to say, the city of Toledo is unlikely to argue the validity of the concept of rights of nature. Toledoans for Safe Water, however, initiated and voted the concept into law, obviously its members did as voters of the polls, uh, and are prepared to advance arguments in support of rights of nature. They said the Lake Erie ecosystem and the group Toledoans for Safe Water have timely brought their motion, have demonstrated a distinctive interest in the litigation, and have shown that their interests will be impaired if they are denied intervener status. So it's important to note that this case, the Jewish Farms case, was different from, uh, importantly, the uh, Grant Township litigation. In the Grant Township case, it, it was clear that the township intended to, and in fact did, uh, provide a full defense for its ordinance. But in the Drews Farms case, uh, public comments, public records suggested that the administration uh, of uh, Toledo did not intend to argue fully in favor of uh, the concept of rights of nature that had been enacted by the, peach, by the people in the Lake Erie Bill of Rights. And so the Lake understandably was worried that the Bill of Rights would not be fully defended and that it needed to be present in order to prevent that full defense. The federal district court denied the intervention motion and the reason it did so is, is important for practitioners to, to uh, be aware of, be aware of. It said, quote, this unusual request is meritless. The amendment does not purport to allow intervention but by the ecosystem in federal district courts. Rather, it states that the Lake Erie ecosystem may enforce its rights in the Lucas County Court of Common Pleas. And so that's state court in Ohio. And indeed, that is what the Lake Erie Bill of Rights said. Uh, I'm not privy to why, but I would speculate that the drafters of the Lake Erie Bill of Rights probably imagined that they preferred to be in state court rather than federal court uh, to defend the Lake Erie Bill of Rights because they might have hoped to get a more favorable reception from the judiciary in the state rather than the federal courts. Um, but of course that would have happened if a direct enforcement action had been filed by uh, the Lake in the Lucas County Court of Common Pleas when in fact what actually happened 
is that Drew's Farm filed the case in federal court. And because the Lake Erie Bill of Rights did not say ecosystems had standing in federal court, the federal district court denied the intervention motion. So it's important for practitioners to, to remember when they're writing up rights of nature laws that the standing provisions should be written as broadly as possible uh, in order to allow nature to appear in any possible court uh, where a case might be brought involving a law, whether it's a direct enforcement by nature or whether it's intervention in a case filed by a business entity. The uh, district court in, in the Drew's Farm case then went on to finish by saying, some may believe the law should confer legal standing upon natural objects and features, but a district court bound by Congress and higher courts is not the appropriate body to take that leap. There are two other attempts at intervention by ecosystems that I will cover briefly. Uh, one was in Oregon, Rex Capri and Wakefield Farms LLC versus Dana W. Jenkins in Lincoln County. This was back in 2000, 2017 in state court in Oregon. Lincoln County in Oregon had adopted an ordinance, a law that uh, banned the aerial spraying of pesticides. Uh, the plaintiffs filed a lawsuit to challenge that law. And the Silence River ecosystem filed an unopposed motion to intervene in the case. So uh, the plaintiffs did not even oppose uh, the Silence River ecosystem appearing in the case. Unfortunately, the court denied the, mo the motion nonetheless. And I believe the court denied the motion from the bench without issuing a, a full written decision uh, with the reasons for the denial. So uh, we don't have uh, an opinion to study in that regard. The other case is Seneca Resources Corporate, Corporation versus Township of Highland. Uh, that case uh, originated in federal district court in, in Western Pennsylvania, similar to the Grant Township case. In Highland Township, the Township of Highland also had adopted uh, a law uh, concerning uh, frack wastewater injection wells and a corporation, Seneca Resources Corporation, sued to uh, overturn the law. Crystal Spring Ecosystem filed a motion to intervene in that case to protect its interests. Unlike in Grant Township, uh, the Township of Highland had had a, uh, a change of administration uh, by virtue of an election that resulted in the, the township was not intending to defend the ordinance uh, as fully as Grant Township has done, had done in its case. Uh, but the judge in the Seneca Resources case, the same judge from the Grant Township case, uh, denied intervention by the ecosystem for the same reason as the court denied intervention in the Grant Township case, finding that Highland Township adequately represented the Crystal Spring ecosystem's interests in that case. The ecosystem appealed to the Third Circuit. That resulted in a reported decision that, uh, though not on the issue that we're aiming to uh, develop law on, the Third Circuit affirmed the denial of intervention because the township had by then repealed the ordinance. And so the Third Circuit decided that the intervention motion was moot. That concludes my presentation.